All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode. I am back with Sotak Andre uh, slash Andrash. Andrash, how are you doing? Um, I'm good. I had a monster, so I might be a bit, uh, you know, more f- uh, more faster. Jesus, <laughs> might be a bit faster paced than usual, which is uh, funny enough. One of my uh, one of my burdens, which has been for a while, my mom has a tendency of speaking very very fast. So basically, if you've heard. Um, uh, ben Shapiro, familiar with him? Yeah, so basically that's how my mom talks. <laughs> and uh, back in high school when I used to live, you know, home, I, I literally had this problem at school where many, many teachers which wouldn't understand me, so I had to deliberately start talking a bit slower. So I might get back to the roots for this episode, <laughs> but I'm, I'm fine overall. I actually came to the... Um realization some time ago that Mike Israel is the Ben Shapiro of the fitness industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, to- like uh, talks fast and like verbally very good and also Jewish, which matters something. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can say it because I am Jewish as well. So, uh, Who is that? Uh, Lion McDonald is the Jose Mourinho of the fitness industry. <laughs> that as well. Uh, other analogies I could not come up with so far. Mike Thurston is the George Michael of the fitness industry. I was, yeah, but anyway. Uh, I wonder who Omar is. Omar is the guy at the party who always tries to be funny and no one laughs, <laughs> at him. I think that's the guy. Oh, yeah, for Omar, we, we would have a couple of good candidates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. Um, yeah, so we want to o- open up the discussion with something that uh, we kind of chatted about a bit. And that is... I've gotten some comments over recent times over the fact that we talked a lot about genetics and drugs and these sorts of things. And I think overall these discussions were well received, but I have gotten a couple of comments that were sort of outlining how we are whining too much about this topic. Like, why do we talk so much about genetic limitations that it's too negative and demotivating? Some comments went as far as to say that, you know, if we view this whole fitness thing so negatively, then why do we even do it still? So I want to talk about this a little bit with you. And, you know, I I thought about it afterwards because to some extent I can understand where they're coming from. So I actually had to ask myself, like, why do we actually talk about this so much? And I came up with basically two reasons why... I talk about this as much as I do recently. So I will hand the mic over to you in a second, but I will give my first reason and then yeah, I'm pleased to. So basically the first reason for me is that I actually don't think that this is just bad news for the sake of bad news. I think there is actually a lot of value to be derived from talking about genetics and limitations. And that is, you know, if I just think back to my initial stages of fitness or I think back to the questions that clients ask me on a weekly basis, you know, I think... Genetics, drugs, and we can sort of lump them together in that whether it's drugs, whether it's genetics, someone has an advantage, which is allowing them to make progress more easily than most people and allows them to make progress on training and to some extent diet modalities more easily than others. And I think when you see someone with an amazing physique who is training a certain way and you're wondering why when you're training that way, you're not getting the same results. I think it can be valuable to know that, well, you know, genetics matter a lot and drugs also matter a lot. So for me, that is that is really the first reason. And, you know, if I just think back to how much I was second guessing myself, how much frustration I had early on, and then how big of a game changer it was when I actually found this out. And of course, if initially it was kind of demotivating, it was sort of disappointing to just think about the fact that I have limitations, because early on, I really thought that I can do anything. But just being familiar with this actually helped me. So that that's my first reason. Um, what about you? Well, you know, I have said this many times that that you know my genetics being what they are um, has sort of been a blessing in disguise in the sense that uh, had I not been, uh, you know, had I been, uh, you know, born with much better genetics. I probably would have been like the guy who you mentioned last night, who shall not be named, who's, uh, you know, someone who has fantastic genetics and might not be the sharpest tool in the shed. So, you know, in a sense, I have been sort of forced to, uh, you know, the quote, question everything and reassess and, uh, you know, think about pretty much everything I do. 
which is funny because when I try to give people, for example, chest training tips, you know, every now and again I get this comment, but you know, like your chest sucks, so why would I listen to you? And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly why you should listen to me because I believe me, I put far more thought into this than pretty much every single guy in this gym who has a better chest than me put together because you know i have friend a friend of mine who just lays back on the bench no setup whatsoever just shoulders like not just this you know the whole chasm thing of scapula protracted it's just like completely protracting the sense it's also shoulder blades rolled up to his ears and elbow uh, uh, upper arm alignment all over the place and he has a big structure genetically and his chest is still recruited well and i was like Jesus fucking Christ, if I did my pressing that way, I I would still have basically a flat color bone <laughs> and basically just bone and fat and that's it. So I'm sort of getting a bit distracted there. But the point is that, you know, I said this for a long time that uh, I've had to sort of work a bit harder, quote unquote, than most people for every gram of result I got simply because I didn't have neither the drugs nor the generic advantage. But, you know, I'll have to be honest, and I, I will admit it, that part of the reason why I, I, I bring this up so, uh, so often is I'm frustrated in a bit. Like, I see people around me who look better than I do and who are fucking idiots. <laughs> and uh, it is what, and of course, I know that comparison is thief of joy and all that, but still, we're human and it's still frustrating, you know, it's still annoying and... Yeah, that's why I bring it up every now and again. Hey, genetics matter, and you might be in the same shoe as I am, and you might think that that's unfair, and it is unfair. And most of the time I do accept it that it is what it is, but every now and again I get frustrated. I'm like, fuck this shit. I mean, why couldn't I have been born with like better genetics and you know, being somewhat uh, uh, more productive? So that's uh, that's the first reason, I think is uh, one to uh, remind others that life is not fair and uh, you know even though you are putting in the the work um, uh, or you, you are putting in as much or even more work than someone else they very well might have better results simply because they have better genetics and there is not a whole lot you can do about it so do you want to continue with point number two or yeah, yeah. Or actually, I forgot to mention one thing about point number one still, and that is uh, the expectation or the management of expectations. And I think this is kind of the point that a lot of people take the wrong way, because that can sound like just, you know, being demotivating for the sake of being demotivating. But, you know, when you hear time and time and again that you know, in the first three years of your lifting journey, you can put on 25 pounds of muscle or 40 pounds of muscle. Yeah, yeah. Like that's the standard figure. First year, 25 pounds of muscle. Second yeah. year, 12 pounds of muscle. After that, seven pounds of muscle. Mm -hmm. You know, when that doesn't happen for you and then you're thinking you're doing something wrong, whereas, you know, just simply talking about the fact that, look, yeah, some people can put on 40 pounds of muscle, but that is, you know, hinging on a couple of assumptions for one, or the main condition being that you're starting off from a completely untrained position, which a lot of people aren't. So, you know, if you were into sports before, maybe yeah. you did some push-ups at home for fun, so you were not starting from like basically negative muscle mass as you started out, then you might not put on 25 pounds of muscle in your first year, and that might still mean that you're actually doing your things right. Like I didn't put on that much, maybe I put on, I don't know, five to 10 pounds of, or maybe 10 pounds of muscle in the first year, 10 pounds of muscle after that, five to 10 pounds. And, you know, in the total of my training career, I put on 25 pounds of muscle. Now, when I figured out that, okay, this is why, that was actually a big relief for me. Like, I stopped second guessing myself all the time. So I think that is another valuable thing to know. And then, yeah. so just ahead. to interrupt, like the only guys for whom that's going to happen that chart is uh, uh, you probably remember that tall guy i sent you from my gym who was like he's i think 19 now and he started training maybe two years ago and he was 47 kilos at 180 centimeters tall so for so for people who are you know from the us and shit that's like five foot eleven and a hundred and i don't know five pounds seven pounds something like that so just ridiculously underweight. I mean, yeah, that guy could easily put on 25 
pounds, I mean, probably 20 kilos in the first year of which, I don't know, 15 probably would be just, you know, where he should have been at that age and at that uh, height. So, yeah, if you're chronically under eating and you're basically, you know, semi-starved uh, all the time and you're basically with 10 kilos behind where you should be uh, naturally for your genetics and your height and all that, then, yeah, of course, you're going to gain 15 kilos of muscle in the first year of which, you know, 10 is just going to be um, where it should have been. And the same, as I said, guys, same goes for women. I mean, I know a couple of girls who, I can think of particularly of one girl who is, you know, who's made some fantastic progress in the first year or two of her lifting. But I knew her back in high school. I mean, she, she was literally 40 kilos and she's probably close to 170 centimeters. So it's the same thing. I mean, this goes for women as well. If you're starting like way behind where you should have been, if you've, you know, for one reason or another, you've been underfed <laughs> most of your life, then yeah, you're probably going to get some um, unexpectedly good results. And whereas if you're someone like us, who've been always, you know, sort of on the higher end of where we should have been, or you'd be ch on the chubbier end, then yeah, you're probably going to, potentially you're going to, diminish in body weight when you first start out so that's that's the really frustrating thing as well which is another uh, tangent it's very hard to quantify muscle mass uh, gains if you're starting out overweight i mean let's say if you started out 85 kilos like i was at some point when i was i don't know seven, 16 years old something like that how much did I actually gain? Who the fuck knows? I mean, if you start out at 85 and you end the year at 83, but you look much better, how much did you gain? You have no idea. <laughs> Whereas, you know, if you start out like really, really skinny, like most of these Instagram figures who, you know, are naturally lean, like, yeah, it's much easier to quantify. It's much easier to put on the before and afters as well. It's much more visually impressive if you've, you know, if you're, well, if you were 70 kilos and after a year of you are 80, and after 10 years, you're 92, then yeah, I put on 22 kilos of muscle, awesome. <laughs> but for someone who's been chubby, it's much more difficult to quantify. Yeah, and um, yeah, lots of examples. I mean, another thing is just the expectations and, and the perspectives are so distorted in the fitness world. Like uh, we talked about this a bunch, but people think that Eric Helms is someone with subpar genetics. Yeah. Like a lot of people <laughs> refer to him as that. Now, uh, Eric Helms may have average genetics for competitive bodybuilding, but for the... Yeah, at words, at words, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he's only getting second and third places on pro shows now. Oh my God, that's terrible. But, you know, for the average population, Eric Helms has better than average genetics. I mean, I don't know if yeah. I can say he has great genetics for the average population because it's hard to quantify what the average population really is. But I mean, look around in your gym. I mean, you will see people who have been training for years. How many are how many of them are as impressive as Eric and and also like speaking of yeah your starting muscle mass like yeah Eric for example he put on like 25 pounds in his first year but look at Eric's before pictures I mean when I started out I wasn't like a naturally kind of buff dude but compared to Eric when I started out I was a muscular dude like I had some some chesticles like some shoulders like I looked like I'm moving my body at least like Eric literally looked like someone who doesn't eat and plays video games all day so so yeah that's that's another thing to take into account and then for me my second real reason why I'm talking about this is that at the moment, I just find this to be an interesting topic. <laughs> and this might seem like um, a selfish reason. And of course, as a content producer, you should always look primarily at what your audience finds interesting. But, you know, here is something that I just kind of have to admit to the listeners and kind of break it to them, that if you've been creating content for a long time, eventually you will be glad if you find something that excites you or a topic that you find interesting. Like, I don't exactly know how many videos I have on YouTube, but I looked up my account and there it says 337 videos, probably approaching 200 hours of content. Now, I am super passionate about my fitness. It's the love of my life. But guys, finding topics that are practical, actionable, and are also somewhat interesting and new, it's not easy once you've done 337 videos. So you will talk about stuff that you just find interesting and you just hope that some other people will find it interesting as well. Like, why do you think that Omar Isaf has like 
30 or 40 videos with almost the same title, like how to get a big back. And the, the answer is always the same, by the way, like pull-ups and rows, always. But, you know, eventually you have to rehash content. And if you go purely the business-minded route and you don't care whatever, like you don't care at all about what you find interesting, you just want to put out content for views, then, yeah, you will never talk about stuff that you find personally interesting. But at a certain time for your own longevity in the content producer game, you sometimes will do that. So this is honestly my reason. And um, yeah, anyway, I have another follow-up, but you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, no, I mean, that's, I think that's a perfectly valid reason to do it. I mean, if you're not enjoying it to some extent, probably not going to stick to it. So I think that's a perfectly valid reason. I'm yeah. actually happy that you didn't bring up what I wanted to bring up because it would be redundant. So. Yeah, and, and, and just a final point to make is, um, and this is just for future reference to any of the listeners who may ever feel annoyed or frustrated when they are listening to someone's podcast, because I understand, like, I love a good podcast, and I love listening to podcasts, and when a podcast that I like, and I'm excited to click on the, the episode, and then I find the discussion to be redundant and kind of boring and annoying, I get frustrated, like, I had times when I borderline felt resentful while listening to a podcast, but what you have to realize is at a certain point, you basically cannot win no matter what type of content you put out. Like if I talk about genetic limitations, then a certain portion of the audience will think that I'm demotivating and overly negative. If I take the other approach and talk about how you know don't care about genetics and limitations, believe in yourself, like just work as hard as you can and you never know how much you can achieve, a certain portion of the audience will find that frustrating and annoying as well. And you might think, okay, why do any of that? Just talk about other stuff, you know, practical and actionable stuff. Guys, trust me, even then, some people will get annoyed by that. Like, I went through a phase where I put out a video every other day, and all, everything was actionable, everything was informative. How can you do this? How can you do that? I was twisting and finding angles on all kinds of topics that I didn't exhaust before, like cyclical bulking, how can you do that, or whatever, this approach to lower your set point, all kinds of stuff. And on every video, I got a handful of comments that were saying, dude, like, why do you overthink, th overthink things so much? It's not that difficult. You just put the fucking weight up, you put it down, you eat your protein, and that's it. So <laughs> no matter what, like... You know, if your videos are getting in the ballpark of a thousand views, a handful of people will find that super redundant and frustrating and annoying and just boring. So just know that if you find something to be really shitty content, just know that another portion of the audience might actually get a lot of value out of it and vice versa. So that's just kind of my concluding remark on this. Yeah, I mean, I was just talking about something similar with a friend of mine who keeps sending me these. There is a rich guy over here who, you know, <laughs> pretty much has a car for every day of the week and they are not your... He has a Lambo, a Ferrari, a Bugatti. Uh, anyways, you can imagine a Rolls Royce. And I was like, dude, okay, I get it. I I'm not really into cars and it is the same thing. I mean, a lot of people find some kind of value by the, <laughs> the follower count he has. Obviously, people like to look at his cars. I just get annoyed by it. So that's, again, one of those things where, where I find interesting others won't find. I mean, for example, Jordan Peterson. That's one of those things, again, that I I have to I had to accept, and Jordan talked about this as well. Not everyone is going to be interested in sort of, I would call it high level, but, you know, more profound discussions about, you know, meaning and... Uh, even just even just the kind of stuff that I particularly think it's normal. I mean, stuff like how to get a better relationship and really think about it and really you know strive to like actually because some people just think that oh well you're gonna just meet the love of your life and it's gonna be perfect and you won't have to put in any effort. You're just gonna know and be able to read each other's thoughts. And I literally had people who told me this, and I was like, I tried to send them a couple of references, but I don't care. I'm not gonna change my mind. You know. So people are different, and you have to accept that. Uh, and and it's sort of it's getting into more global discussion, but basically you got to find the people who are going to be on the same wavelength as you, and that applies for real life, that applies to internet content as well. So that's, for example, why a couple of people told me that, hey, why do you keep posting memes on your Instagram stories? I was like, because I think they're funny, and 
other people think they're funny as well and a certain number of people do not and those people are free to unfollow me <laughs> and you know just or just skip them and watch the other content i don't care i mean it is what it is yeah yeah i mean it's like it's like i think omar isaf has shitty jokes same but that's <laughs> but but that's fine like you know you not everybody has to love your content like omar has you know close to a million followers like he, he doesn't need you or me to love his content he has hundreds of thousands of other people who think his jokes are awesome and that, that's all good and the same thing applies to us uh just just one thing i forgot to mention if you're actually curious of what kind of demotivating messaging looks like check out the hit high intensity training crowd like and and some of them i actually really like like doug mcguff dr doug mcguff i actually really enjoy listening to him anytime even when he says stuff that i disagree with i just really appreciate his wisdom and perspectives on stuff but basically their message is that you know your genetics will allow you to get it big as you will get but you know in their mind that limitation is just so preposterously modest that mm -hmm. i actually think that that is holding people back so and and most of these hit guys like you know a 511 guy might weigh i don't know 70 fucking kilos after like 10 years of lifting or something it's, it's like all of them are skinny like they don't even look like they lift dr doug mcguff is actually pretty jacked amongst them but you know most of them are just really really unimpressive and it's like well but 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 that, that's what you can achieve like it's all genetics like anyone who's bigger than that is just a freak so you know like there are levels to this so i think um we found a, a reasonable middle ground here but maybe like one thing we can take away from this is just don't don't whine about the topic for the sake of whining about it so maybe we can take that too far and um, you know you can be redundant on whatever message so maybe maybe we've said enough about that just in terms of explaining how much limitations matter and maybe from now on we can try to find a productive spin on it so each time we talk about this we can follow up with some more like actionable advice so and by the way this is what we recommend so that's just a side comment yeah so uh with that i i think i'll address my or you know you sort of asked initially like why what are the reasons As you said that you have two i also have two um so here's the second sort of bigger reason because the the first one of being frustrated with reality it is what it is but the second reason is um is I keep bringing it up because I know exactly <laughs> what people are going through. So I was there. I mean, I did that. I did the set progressions. I I truly believe that, hey, the reason why I haven't been making the kind of gains I, I feel like I deserve to make is I haven't been training optimally. And that's, in a sense, is, is a good uh, way of thinking because, hey, you can always do something better, of course. Um, but again, the reality is people who are blessed, you're going to know it in six months. Like, <laughs> look at Jeff Alberts, look at Canyon, look at any one of these fucking freaks of nature who within a year look like they've been training for five. I mean, I have a photo on my Instagram after three years of training, and that's been already, again, doing every muscle group twice a week. I, I was actually thinking about this. I was like, because, you know, I already, I, mo I mostly have like three protein feedings a day, maybe four, but my average is probably three. I was like, am I really miss am I missing out on something? I was, I was genuinely asking myself, like, could I be making better gains? And then I remember that when I started lifting in high school, I was eating six meals a day. Literally, I would wake up 5.30, have a meal, 8, have a meal, 11, have a meal, 2 o'clock, have a meal, 3, 3, 3.30, 4, go train, 7, go home, have a meal nine o'clock then have a meal <laughs> i did that and i still didn't gain 25 pounds of muscle in a year and 15 the year after after three years i look like well i look like some of the evidence-based online physique transformation coaches these days but that's a separate discussion <laughs> so basically i look like like skinny fat i look like someone with some of my muscle but <laughs> And that was already following evidence-based practice. Lots of protein, training each muscle group twice a week, that sort of stuff. And, you know, I've had that phase of around 2.5, 2 3 years when I thought that, hey, the, okay, I haven't been doing enough volume. And I've had my phase of doing 50 sets per week for chest, literally. Um, 
still didn't change anything. So that's my biggest. 50, 5 zero? Five zero, yeah. Wow. How, how did you do that? How did you set that up? Monday, Wednesday, Friday. <laughs> wow. 15 ish or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, but you can imagine how efficient I've been with my my execution and stuff. But that's a separate discussion. So so yeah, that's why I, I keep harping on this because I've been that guy. It's not like I you know I just throw my hands up in the air. Oh well, it is what it is, generics, whatever. And I I still try to. I mean, that's the funny thing. I still constantly think about how I can do things better. It's just I do things better differently. I honestly think that the people who or the kinds of things people mentally masturbate about, this sort of gives people the false expectation. It's not properly contextualized. I think that's where I want to get. And the second thing, and I'm going to end it soon, is it's really offensive because uh, people who have fantastic genetics get offended when you point them out, point out to them that, hey, you have really great genetics. And they're like, well, genetics doesn't exist. Luck doesn't exist in bodybuilding. There's that guy I sent you who's like 160 something centimeters, 80, 85, 86 kilos in contest shape almost. And you you have the fucking straight face to say that luck doesn't matter in bodybuilding. <laughs> I mean, come on. You're, you're really fucking much more stupid than you're muscular. I mean, at that point. And you are really muscular. So that says a lot. I mean... Really, luck has no place in bodybuilding. Because, okay, they, they get offended when you point out that, hey, yeah, you work hard, but you have also fantastic genetics. But what about the other way? Because if you look at it from the other point of view, what you're saying is anyone who is not at your level is just a lazy fucking piece of shit. <laughs> right? Because, hey, if genetics doesn't matter and luck has no place, then it's all about hard work that anyone who's not, you know, 20 kilos over their height in minus, you know, meter, which you talked about last time. So if I'm 184, I'm not 100 kilos at 10% body fat, that's because I'm a lazy fucking piece of shit. <laughs> and I, I don't work hard enough, which, okay, perhaps is right, but I don't think so. Because that's, that's the way it works. People don't really look at things from the other perspective. They just look at it from their own perspective. Oh, well, you're offending me by saying I have good genetics. You're downplaying my hard work. But in the same way, you're downplaying someone else's hard work by saying that genetics doesn't matter. And it's all their fault. I mean... Yeah, um, and... Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is... And, and this is the part which I just find personally interesting. So th this is... Like what you just said, Andre. Like the um, that that guy who was saying that thing about there is no such thing as bodybuilding in luck. Like, does this information help anybody? No, it's just some funny banter, and we just find it interesting. So this is a good example of what I talked about. Another thing is, so just yesterday I was listening to a podcast discussion, and there was a guy on that discussion who has a marvelous physique, like absolutely fabulous. Like I would give like fucking two of my pinky fingers if I could look like that, and. Man, it was so crystal clear that the guy had, like, no fucking idea about the whole... Like, nothing he said made any fucking sense whatsoever. It was honestly just mind-blowing. So this is, again, just, just, just something that's, uh, like, intellectually I find interesting how someone can have such amazing results with such little brain power. Just amazing. But um, I would also say that... You know, all of these things, the optimization and uh, optimizing things, which will probably not matter a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. I only see that honestly as a negative if they are actually not getting the results that they want and they are frustrated while sim simultaneously trying to optimize everything. So this is where working together with some clients who went through that whole journey or currently are going through that whole journey that you talked about, like trying to manage every single detail and they're just spinning their wheels. Like I have a client currently, uh, we've been actually working together for a long time. And when he came to me, I mean, his strength level was, um, I cannot recall numbers from the top of my mind, but basically they were like at the didn't even reach like intermediate levels. If you look at like the EXRX strength standards, like basically none of his lifts reached even intermediate levels. And he was like super hardcore about a lot of these stuff. His knowledge base was pretty high up. And, you know, in that case, just simply pointing out that, look, like this is actually, in my opinion, not, not your best bet. And I think you should start out with something simple, easily manageable, something where you can quantify your progress in an easy way. I think you will do much better doing that. I think that's very useful. But if someone is enjoying the process, getting decent results, 
and is optimizing a few things that they don't need to. So I don't think people need to consume intra-workout carbs. I don't think that people need to progress their sets. Like there's a lot of things which I think are just not necessary and are just introducing more complexity, more financial costs, time costs into the equation. But if someone likes that, it's fine. You know, like I, I don't think people necessarily need to track their fats and carbs, even if they do track your calories. I think just tracking calories and protein is more than enough. But I had times in my life where just having my fitness pal all the time and tracking down everything and planning out my nutrition for the next day and spending half an afternoon planning out how I'm going to eat that day. That was fun. Like I enjoyed it. Yeah, and same. Yeah, right. And if at that time someone told you that, hey, you don't need to do that, you can actually have great results without doing any of that, you would have been like, dude, like you're ruining my fun here. Get the fuck out. So that that is a real thing. So I don't necessarily see any problem with that. It's just when someone is spinning their wheels, then I think it's worth intervening. Yeah. Yeah. But even back then, I, I didn't really do it because I thought it was fun. I was doing it because I thought it would be the best way uh, towards, you know, greatness. Uh, and and it, I mean, it could be the best way towards your own greatness. And that's the real thing. I mean, with social media, because if you had no one else to compare yourself to, I mean, even myself, like if you showed me back in 2011 how I look now, I would have been like, fuck, holy shit. I, who's that guy? I want to look like that if I, you know, it head was cut off or something. I want to look like that. And now I'm really, really, you know, I'm not, okay, I'm not really unhappy. I'm semi-unsatisfied when I look around on Instagram, basically. But hey, if social media didn't exist, then yeah, um, I think I would be very happy. And I think that applies um, to a broad spectrum of things, but I think that's uh, common for many, many people. So that's the, that's, that's why I, you know, I try to, you know, apply Jordan's rule of, you know, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not who someone else is today. Because there's always someone who's better and and uh, smarter and stronger and and more whatever, richer and has more money and has more women. So it's just a never-ending cycle. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, we exhausted that topic pretty well. Um, is there anything else we want to yeah. discuss? Oh, yeah, this was another criticism of mine, or not necessarily criticism, there was a feedback on your on your page. Someone said that, you know, why did I say that uh, I, for example, would like to stay lean a year round because I look better, or I probably said something that people look better with lower body fat percentages or something like that. And someone left a comment saying that, why uh, did I say that when, I don't know, he used someone example of, he looks great even with higher body fat percentage. And I, I sort of resp replied there, but I would like to respond here as well, because perhaps others had the same question. <laughs> I said that because, again, this is one of those things that, hey, it's genetically determined, so yeah, it's down to luck. So where you store your body fat is going to hugely influence this. So for example, most of your favorite Instagram influencers are people who store body fat mostly in their legs. So if you look at Matt August, for example, Matt August has a midsection. I mean, he admits this. I mean, I like August. <laughs> he he literally, I remember years ago this was, he, he posted a video of himself. He was like, well, what do you think my body fat percentage is? And he has a full six pack. And I was like, yeah, it's probably 18%, August said. <laughs> 18%, what? And then he turned around and, you know, yeah, he has love handles and he has, you know, lower back fat and that sort of stuff. But from the front, he looks fantastic. So yeah, if I had the body fat distribution like that, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't mind being at whatever 20% body fat. I mean, I would still look fantastic. However, if you're like me, one, you're going to look re relatively small increases in body fat are going to cause a disproportionate uh, downgrade of your ap appearance. So right now I'm around 84 something, 85 kilos. And believe me, if I put that photo next to my lowest weigh in at 82.5 you're gonna think i gained like six seven kilos of body fat <laughs> it's like two kilos but most of it is around my midsection and i'm a bit flatter because i haven't really been training but that's the separate discussion but still like all things being equal to i mean you've seen my photos at 90 something i mean that's not a whole lot i mean less than 10 kilos and i look fucking obese <laughs> 
I literally had people who accused me of a friend of mine who said you must have taken something. There's no way that you look so much better, even if you know. Like for me, dropping five kilos of body fat is hu disproportionately. Um, it's gonna cause a disproportionate amount of improvement visually. Whereas someone who let's say stores body fat e either more um, symmetrically, let's put it that way, or disproportionately more in the lower uh, body is not gonna have the same effect. I mean, you've probably seen those photos. Uh, Cliff Wilson had a point, the post uh, made a very good point about this at one point, is that, you know, people say, oh, you gotta be, you know, you should only bulk until your abs disappear or something like that. <laughs> Which is one of those, one of, another one of those generalizations that makes me wanna pull out my hair. And he posted himself, I think, and he he's the same as me. I think he was maybe 10 pounds up from stage weight and his abs were gone 10 pounds or 15 at the most which is insignificant uh, compared to what people and then he, he had a client of his who gained like 15 kilos i think so like 35 pounds and he still had abs and you know if you only look myopically at that midsection thing and you would be like well cliff has to stay i don't know <laughs> eight pounds over stage with at all times <laughs> and that's just not a, not a good way to make progress so that's the thing and and the second part of that is just if you are unlucky in the sense that you have a gen genetically predisposed to store more body fat around your midsection it's unhealthier uh sort of it touched on uh, last time i think as well but it's worth repeating it's if you store body fat in your legs whatever but you don't really have lots of organs there <laughs> But uh, if you store body fat around your midsection, there's a lot of visceral fat that's going to accumulate, and that's not a good thing. I mean, yeah, that's easy to get rid of, but hey, if you're not getting rid of it, long term, it's probably not going to be a good thing for your health. So, so yeah, that's the, that's the reason why. I mean, and, and I think, again, that is one of those mood points, because people who store body fat like August are gonna inevitably still be happier at a higher body fat percentage. So they are not really concerned about this. And the people who are like me, who are concerned, are typically the people who do have that typical male, because uh, that's a typical male uh, body fat pattern storage. Because, you know, supposedly back in the day, you had to have lean legs so you can run after animals and stuff. So that's why uh, storing it around your midsection was a bit easier. Yeah. It's um, it's actually so. I have a video which I'm gonna share on uh, YouTube at one point, probably in a couple of videos, and that was taken where I was getting ready for my photo shoot, and so I could probably pull up my log, but I think I was like just under 80 kilos. I think I was like 79.5 or something, and it was mind blowing to me that I still couldn't see my abs without flexing. And it was like, I cannot believe, like, how lean do I have to get? Seriously, like, do I have to be a skeleton to <laughs> actually see my abs without flexing? Like, all these motherfuckers that I see on Instagram, like, they're way fatter than I am, and they already have abs without flexing. And so this is a pro tip for you guys, but I'll do an actual video on this. Not being hairy helps a lot. So uh, I eventually just like, okay, fuck it. So I bought this um, shaving cream thing, and I, like, applied it on myself, mm -hmm. got in the shower, and as I was washing that off, I was I was like shocked because all of a sudden I started seeing the veins and the visible abs and all these details that I didn't see because it was covered under body hair. And <laughs> like I was literally like, I barely could go to sleep because I was so enthusiastic. Like, oh my God, I can see my abs without flexing. Because that, that was literally something I never, ever, ever had that happen to me. I, you know, I've seen my abs for years at that point with flexing under good lighting. I had some sick ab shots, but without flexing, it looked like just a regular, like shitty looking stomach. And it even looked like a bit skinny fat without flexing. So I was like really bummed about it. And I have a video where I'm standing in front of the camera and I'm like, my God, my life, my purpose, I can see my abs. <laughs> and I'm kind of like just dancing around the camera. Like I look like a teenage kid who got drunk or something. Uh, so th th that's a pro tip. So Maybe without body hair on you, you can see your abs better. But probably like right now, um, I actually shaved my or just like trimmed my chest and my stomach recently to see like, ah, maybe I can see them already. But no, not yet. So probably I have to lose at least another like four or so kilos before I will I will get close to that. All right. So so another topic that I figure we should touch on since it's 
relevant and uh, it just came out is uh, let me look or pull up that uh, mass issue so the latest mass issue has been published yesterday and uh, there's been a there have been multiple interesting studies there but the one i wanted to bring up is related to the whole uh getting lean before your bulk right so this idea that in order to gain relatively higher percentage of muscle per total body weight gain you know you should start diet down first so you know the idea relates to insulin sensitivity and what's called the peer ratio or partitioning ratio and you know this idea that in order to potentiate to use a fancy word potentiate further muscle gains you should cut down first and this was a rodent study but uh, still i think it's uh it's relevant because hey in rodents you can do stuff that um, you can't really do in, uh, in humans so i'm gonna read the key points from that uh, uh mass or do you know that segment of, of mass so the study they reviewed was the effects of diet composition and chronic obesity on muscle growth and function this Souza et al 2020 from eric Traxler is the write-up so Eric said that, you know, the presently reviewed study found that obesity doesn't necessarily impair hypertrophy in mice, and leaner mice do not necessarily make better gains in response to muscular loading. Second point, it's become common to suggest that getting leaner will potentiate subsequent hypertrophy by improving one's P ratio via enhanced insulin sensitivity. But the evidence for this claim is pretty flimsy. The most muscular drug free lifters and athletes in the world tend to have relatively high body fat levels. Longitudinal studies in strong people who lift find that obese, insulin-resistant lifters make gains that are similar to lean, insulin-sensitive lifters, and weight loss typically has neutral or negative effects on P ratios during weight regain. Meaning, you know, once you diet down, you're gonna gain exactly the same amount, or you're gonna get disproportionately more body fat, which is not what we want. So in conclusion, there are plenty of good reasons to do a fat loss phase, but potentiating hypertrophy doesn't seem to be one of them. And the reason I bring it up because Mike shared one of his older infographics from one of his books, which <laughs> pretty much it was, so, it was very, very funny. I don't think he timed it. I think it was just common uh, or funny uh, coincidence <laughs> that he basically said the exact opposite is like you know for reasons probably closely related to insulin sensitivity linear individuals gain a higher percentage of muscle when they train hard and eat a hypercaloric diet than do less lean individuals again this is one of the things where citation needed that is all has been equal a leaner person might gain maybe half a pound of muscle per week where the same individual if 10 percent higher in body fat might only be able to put on a third of a pound of muscle per week. Again, citation needed. While the exact mechanism of this are yet unclear, the implications are very clear. If you're trying to gain mass for too long, over 12 weeks or so in most cases, the fraction of the mass gain that is muscle starts to dip quite low and the fraction of mass that is fat starts to rise. All right, so um, I think the second... Uh, the second part is actually true, which is if you try to gain mass for too long over, you know, past that 12 weeks or so, you start gaining uh, more fat and less muscle mass. But I think that has fuck all to do with how lean you were at the beginning. It uh, has to do with diminishing returns. <laughs> and again, going back to your genetics, I mean, yeah, past a certain point, you're going to run out of muscle that you can gain. <laughs> regardless of how lean you started so it's not like so this is again one of those things that just irks me to no end it's like it's not like just be, let's say whatever there's person who always has been 20 percent body fat always struggled with being lean always struggled with having to fight his body's tendency to gain fat and let's say they diet down somehow somewhat leaner physique to 15 percent and then they read this article and they'll be like, or whatever, post and be like, well, fuck me. It took me, finally got to 15%. I finally feel like I'm ready to gain some muscle. And now I have to diet down to 10% because I'm going to gain more muscle. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not true. I mean, 
uh, yeah, sure, if someone is, again, one of those skinny kids who is naturally, you know, naturally underfed or something like that, then, yeah, you're going to gain a large amount of muscle mass compared to your, or in relative to your total body weight gain, but that's because you have been so severely under-muscled relative to your genetics, um, whereas if someone, you know, is at the normal muscularity or someone who has been training for a while and has already is above average uh, muscularity compared to their own genetic set point, uh, regardless of how much you gain, I think you're just gonna um, you're just gonna gain probably the same amount, or regardless of how lean you start out. Now, of course, this has some limits. I'm not saying start at 50 percent, five zero percent body fat, but you know what? Anything under than twenty percent tops, like I'm, I, I don't think that if you start at ten percent body fat, for example, and you go and you gain, let's say, I don't know, six kilos, you're gonna gain four kilos of muscle or four and a half kilos of muscle whereas if you start at 15 percent and you gain the six kilos then now suddenly you're only gonna gain like two and a half kilos of muscle and the rest is gonna be body fat i think it could very well be the case that starting so lean for you relatively speaking is gonna just make you feel weak you might have less energy you might perform uh, shittier sets in the gym you might have sleep issues all of those actually, I think, weigh much more than where your starting body fat percentage was. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, um, so basically the thing that Mike is referring to, I mean, there is some observational evidence for that, and that is the, you know, the Forbes study that was done yeah, like yeah, many yeah. years ago, which basically, I mean, this was overdone so many times. I mean, it's it, it has been addressed. The limitations of this study have been addressed for basically just as much as the whole like 25 FFMI, like no natural lifter can get bigger than that. Basically, that study and this Forbes study have been addressed so many times. And basically- If you allow me to interrupt, um it says Eric's, Eric uh, Trexler actually brought this study up and he said that, however, it appears that the sample is largely made up of anorexia nervosa patients, lactating women, and people who recently underwent prolonged total starvation to induce traumatic weight loss. As far as I can tell, none of the participants were undergoing resistance training and the overfueling protocols were not standardized in any way with variable magnitudes, durations, macronutrient profiles, and so on. <laughs> if we're trying to draw interferences about the topic at hand, I think I might actually feel more comfortable generalizing results from mouse study with muscular overload and the standardized intervention than the human data presented in the force figure, which is commonly leaned on. <laughs> Just uh Yeah. And like really my my only problem with you know, statements like this, like, you know, if you're leaner you might gain half a pound, and if you're not as lean then you might gain a third of a pound. Like you know, just put that out a bit more tentatively, I guess. Like maybe, maybe that would be a good approach to take because it influences a lot of people's thinking. And again, like this is one example where this can actually be harmful. And, you know, some people have taken this a lot further than than Mike in this post. Like some people actually think that if you're not 8% body fat, that you then you cannot go into a gaining phase. And it's like, come on, like give me a break. Like you have any idea how lean 8% body fat mm -hmm. is? Like I was lean when I started dieting already. I had a full six pack. Like I looked good. It was, it was a yeah. three months diet, lots of sleepless nights, lots of sexless meetings with my girlfriend. I paid a very heavy price to get to 8% body fat. So you're telling me that I have to get there to start a gaining phase? Like, come on, give me a fucking break. And even, and this is another thing, like 15% um, body fat is a lot leaner than most people realize. Like uh, even at 20% body fat, a muscular male, like, Andras, for you, it might be a little bit different because you have this uh, more central fat storage yeah. pattern. Like, may maybe a little bit beyond just the average male like storage pattern, which is already central. But, you know, like, at 20% body fat, a lot of muscular guys will look actually pretty decent. And at 15%, like, you can look pretty damn impressive. So 10 to 12% body fat is fucking lean for most people. So, and... Like, do you know how many times, like, I look back at prior pictures of mine, like, I was, like, fucking skinny, and I was still cutting because I was like, no, no, I have to get leaner to go into a gaining phase. 
and then I actually started to know a little bit better. So yeah, like, like this is the issue with this, that like when, when you're putting out something that can actually influence people in a negative way, like you just have to be a lot more contextual, give a lot more disclaimers because like, fuck, it will have consequences. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think this attitude is confounded by two huge variables, probably both of, of which are intertwined. One is set by people who are, are and have always been naturally lean, for whom getting lean is not an issue. And again, these people tend to forget that not everyone is like them. And for some, getting lean actually is a struggle. Yeah, like that post that I put out on uh, Joe Statics, you know, the I just posted on Instagram yesterday, like his meal. And it's like, well, yeah, the non-hungry shed shredded man. And I did a long video on this one time, like going through his diet. And man, like this is the thing like many times the people who stay super lean all the time like those are just not the people you should be taking diet advice from because yeah like when you're that lean man like or at least yeah or at least someone who has never been overweight ever <laughs> yeah yeah like um it's you know anyone who says things like i can i can i don't understand how people can do this and that well if you don't understand how people can do this and that then you shouldn't be coaching people like yet like learn a bit or yeah. work with a few more yeah. people, you know, just learn from their experiences. Like eating 10,000 calories a day, not hard at all if you have the right psychology, quote unquote, right psychology for that. Yeah, yeah. Tons, tons of boredom eating, not hard at all if you have the right psychology for that. And then, yeah, getting full on things like white rice and foods like that, it's, it's not going to fly for a lot of people. So, yeah, that, that's kind of the irony that some the people who do the best job at a certain stuff seemingly are often not the people you should yeah. be learning from. Like I, I think I, like this is not me tooting my own horn. Like I think you can learn a lot more from me, even though I cannot stay at seven percent body fat year round, or I'm not willing to stay at seven percent body fat year round. But I think you can learn a lot more from me, like actually getting there, than someone who has a relatively easy time, like freaking staying there all the time while like very obviously not even paying a lot of attention to appetite management and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for example, I don't think I would be the best coach to quote unquote, uh, uh train quote unquote higher gainers simply because I, I mean, conceptually I can relate to it, but practically not really. I mean, my ex-girlfriend, she, she would literally eat a yogurt and, and the banana and be like, I'm full. And I was like, or you know we have these these uh, stuffed uh, cabbage rolls, you know, tilted capusta, and then she's like, "Well, I have one or two, and I'll be fine." I'm like, "One or two, and you're fine." I'm like, "I eat one or two before while I I'm thinking whether I should eat or not." <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, one or two? I mean, I literally packed away twenty of them, and I was like, "Well, okay." Is there any more left? No, fuck. I would have eaten some more. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's hard to relate to someone who has never been in that in that shoe. Um, and yeah, I definitely think that, for example, if you're if you're someone who has always tried to get lean or always been overweight stuff like that, look, people like you know that Darko Botich or Carter Good are fantastic people to to learn from if you're trying to get to a quote-unquote healthy body fat level and if you're trying to get to leaner more athletic body fat percentage that people like you or dare i say me are probably somewhat better bet now that's not to say that you cannot learn anything from people who've always been lean but if you find that they have no introspection or no they haven't given it any thought. They just eat when their body tells them to eat whatever. Um, that's probably not a good idea. I mean, my colleague, for example, he's always lean, but hey, he thinks about it. I mean, he is very meticulous with his his, his food selection, um, especially during his his, his uh, carb ups. So even during his uh, you know carb ups before competitions, most people you see you know start jamming. Uh, you know, rice cakes and um, jams and stuff like that. And he's like, well, I have to load on oats because otherwise I get too hungry and and even a thousand grams of carbs won't uh, make me full and stuff like that. And that shows that, hey, he actually thinks about that. Whereas others, like you said, they just eat, you know, a couple of pieces of cheese and some, some meat and three pieces of cherry tomatoes and hey, 
that's my meal. I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ, the only thing that would accomplish is making me hungry for some actual food. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy the difference between people there. But yeah, I, I don't think I would be a good coach for these hard gainers as well, because I think I would be just chronically condescending and annoyed with them. <laughs> like when, when they're telling me, oh, like, I went to this restaurant and I just couldn't eat enough. I'm like, dude, just grow the fuck up and learn to enjoy your food. Like I would have such a hard time getting out of that mindset, I think. But- yeah, but the funny thing is, and that's the thing, my ex-girlfriend, at one point she went up, she was fat like she was fat fat and i asked her like how the fuck did she do it i mean i sort of met out the figure and it was she she basically diet she she basically was yo-yo dieting most of her life or most of her a large part large portion of her her adult life and and you know at one point i remember we were walking and I, that's what i do on romantic walks with my girlfriend i met out the the daily calorie requirement for her to put on that much fat in that short amount of time and she basically was in like in a thousand calorie surplus each day or something like, or she had to have eaten like 3500 calorie each day something like that roughly speaking and that's the fuck down for her and i said how did you do it because it's not like she lies to me because you know we've been together for a while so i know like it's not like you know she actually eats a lot but when she's with me she is ashamed to eat stuff like that no she actually <laughs> that's how little she eats and i was like how the hell did you do it like how did you get up like she she was she's around 64 65 kilos right now and at one point she was almost 80 78 or so <laughs> which is a lot and i was like how did you do it and i was like i don't know i was just ate crap so yeah it's uh that's one one point i also wanted to bring up last time it's i guess it's worth mentioning now it's you really really cannot out train a bad diet even though i said in the past that hey it's Theoretically, it's possible. Practically, it's not going to be. I mean, if in May, for example, I gained, uh, I don't know, maybe three kilos of body fat or something like that, three to four maybe even. And believe me, I was training six days a week. I was getting in almost 20,000 steps. Most people will not get that. And I still, I probably ate at least 5,000 calories on average daily uh which is a fuck ton and most people who are sedentary who get like three thousand steps per day and let's say they train three times per week with weights if they are lucky yeah forget about that (laughs) if you don't get your diet under control you're not gonna get lean or you're not gonna lose fat period it's just your color requirements are so low if you um if you're sedentary most of the day it's just sad and it is what it is it's unfortunate and people might look at let's say if you give them a diet and it's 2200 calories be like what 2200 calories but i read somewhere that they have to eat 3000 it's like well if you sit on your ass all day then you don't (laughs) sorry you don't get to eat 400 grams of carbs just because you walk from your kitchen to the office and then you walk from the office to the refrigerator and back it's 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 too much it is what it is yeah yeah i I honestly think that um because we talked about this that like my girlfriend for example like she has no freaking appetite we we talked about this like you said your your girlfriend didn't either and but she like whenever we eat out or something she eats so little and i think if she was to just uh, not snack on some shit at home just randomly I mean, honestly, she could drop probably like five kilos, like effortlessly. Like she would never even have to be like hungry the slightest bit. So she clearly has the gifts. She just has some bad habits. But another thing actually I wanted to bring up um, because we had a comment. So there was one like really harsh comment under our last uh, last podcast episode, basically telling us how we are doing it all wrong. Um, would you say that you have disordered eating at this point? Because that was like one comment that we got that we both have disordered eating pretty much. Um, what do you think? Oh, I, I honestly hate these types of questions. I hate the whole abnormal or like what the fuck is normal? Like what's, I mean, just I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm not trying to be a dick to you or I sort of get your question. But like, like let's, let's, let's take normal, uh, let's define it or let's use it uh, in this conversation as what's most common (laughs) by that standard what's most common is people who are overweight and obese oh yeah yeah 
So by the standard, yes, I have disordered eating because I'm not overweight and I'm not obese. <laughs> like, you know, that's the thing. Like, what is normal? Eating 100 grams of protein in a meal, hey, it's not normal, perhaps. Okay, perhaps, you know, um, ignoring your your hunger cues and going to bed hungry because you're trying to lose fat is also perhaps not normal. Um, yeah, I, I will admit that, hey, when I get those impulses of you know eating more and i know i have i have the issue still where i have days but that thing that's just either related to emotions or simply being tired where even though i ate a lot and my stomach hurts i still have this drive to eat in my head and i have the drive to eat you know very specific foods um you might call that disordered eating i don't know <laughs> but i think a lot of people do that Regardless, and uh, and I seen you post something about whether fitness made you happier, and I think it definitely made put me in a better place. Even though, um, you know, some it's, 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 I don't know, it's a difficult conversation, difficult answer to give because I think it's very contextual. It really depends on what you mean by, you know, what's normal and what you mean by disorder. Disorder compared to what exactly? You know, that's why I struggle to sort of answer it. I don't think I'm clinical. <laughs> I I don't really do the whole purge thing. I don't. Feel, well, I do feel guilty a bit, but <laughs> that's because I ruin my progress. I don't feel guilty. I don't think I'm a bad person because oh my goodness, I ate cookies. I feel like I I feel bad because I let myself down compared to the standard I tried to set out for myself, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I let myself down compared to my perhaps my aesthetic goals perhaps but yeah <laughs> yeah i mean I, I guess um in a in a fitness context i think what most people think of as i mean in, in an ideal world if i could just you know pick my sort of internal well, i guess you can, cannot have external psychology so if i could just pick my psychological makeup in relation to dieting and eating in general I would say that it would be, you know, food is whatever. I just don't care about it. I don't really look forward to my meals. I'm not like, oh my God, when can I finally eat? I never have that, even during dieting. Yeah. I enjoy <laughs> eating, but there are like 15 things that I enjoy a lot more than eating. Um, you know, never have any urges to overeat, never have to have a little bit of self-talk with myself. So all of these things, because food is just like, food is just like, you know, like, you know, these people, like um, my mother is like that. She just like literally doesn't give a shit about food. I forget to eat occasionally because I get caught up doing something. I'm like, oh, fuck, I didn't eat today at all. And it's 6 p.m. Occasionally I would have that. So, you know, like that would be in a perfect world. Now, I think... Once you've gone through a couple of dieting phases and once you're you're like under eating purposefully for 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 an extended period, I honestly think that it's going to happen to very 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 few people. And admittedly like at a certain time like I went through such long phases where I was dieting for a very long time, then I would ruin my progress really quickly because I just started binging as so as soon as I was done with the diet and then I had to diet again for a long time. Like I had 3 or 4 years when you know, 70% of my year was spent dieting. And, you know, like, since you can undo a week of dieting in one day, it's not, it's the math is pretty easy how all of that was possible. So I think it's really hard to just completely undo all of that past. This is something I talked about in that video. So I would say that I am with disordered eating. Like I am with, like, basically, I'm like an alcoholic who was once you know, had serious alcohol problems and now he is clean and has been clean for, mm. you know, three, four years and, you know, didn't have a drink, is not dreaming about alcohol anymore, but he knows that, okay, if I go and start drinking, my problems will, will return again. So I would say I am like that with this whole disordered eating stuff. So I'm not, I don't have binge eating issues anymore. I'm fine. Like if you look at me from the outside, you would say that my eating behavior is completely normal, but I exactly know how I could like reinvoke all of those problems again if I wanted to. Basically, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Uh, I, I, I think that the kind of situation you you outlined is perhaps ideal, but practically speaking, not tenable for most people. I also think this is largely outside of your control in the sense that it's probably determined by what you've been raised with or how you were raised. 
uh, by your parents. Uh, I definitely am a foodie. I never not think about food. Um, even if I am fine, I'm just like, hey, I look forward to eating. <laughs> even if it's the most boring stuff, even if it's just chicken and some veggies, hey, I still like to eat. Um, I actually enjoy the, you know, the ritual of putting the stuff there. I, I literally had pe many people told me this. I mean, girlfriends, friends, I've had people tell me like, <laughs> my former girlfriend, she's like, I cannot believe how uh, happy and, you know, excited you are to eat that fucking bowl of curry cheese for like the 20th time this month. And I was like, yeah, because it's good. <laughs> it tastes good. I'm hungry. I like it. And yeah, I might be more excited yeah. to eat some sort of a junk food, but I get excited to eat, period. Um, I literally, you know, I had people tell me that, hey, now, fuck, I, I was watching you eat, now I'm hungry, because you eat with such a good appetite that, hey, it <laughs> makes me want to eat. Um, so yeah, that's definitely, in my case, um, I, I, do, I do feel like I need to get better with listening to my internal cues, in the sense that I definitely eat past the um, comfort point, let's say, in the sense that, you know, I probably should, I feel like, okay, that I had enough, but I still want to eat more. And that's something I, I need to work on. And hey, you might call that disordered eating. I think that's just a person who likes to eat and likes food probably a bit more than they should. But hey, we all, <laughs> like I said last time, we all have uh, vices and we all, um, we all sin differently and we all like to think that we are better than others just because we sin differently from them. So I think the that person who, you know, just said that just like in a condescending way or whatever, like just started arrogantly criticizing us. I'm fairly certain that he has his own uh, ways of, of <laughs> sinning and perhaps, you know, that's the kind of stuff where you should look at your own behavior first, you know. But oh yeah, and 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 also like keep in mind like um, yes, like I have some residual kind of leftover byproducts from that past of like pretty disordered eating, and now my behaviors are pretty healthy. But yeah, I can feel that that past is there. So let's put it that way. Like, do you think if I? Because basically his point was like you're like so negative, you're never satisfied with your physiques and you have disordered eating. Like, why are you even into fitness? Like, dude, do you think if I was not into fitness, like uh, all of that would not be there? Like, yeah. Like At this point, if I didn't start lifting, I probably would be obese and diabetic. That's not a joke. And and and, and probably a virgin still, <laughs> by the way. That's also not a joke. Yeah, I mean, I think that if I stopped <laughs> lifting now, I mean, first of all, it would have a terrible impact on my mental well-being. Like, um, I mean, I talked about this on the, that video, so I don't want to rehash the whole thing. But, you know, like there are just so many issues that I can deal with better mentally because I am lifting and because I have this goal in the back of my mind always. So I think my mental well-being would just drop drastically. And all the issues that I have with food would still be there. It's just that for any kind of... Any kind of problem would be exacerbated even more because my physical activity would be lower. So yeah. So one final thing: um, people who are quick to judge others, um, either because they are overweight or either because they are like us, and hey, we are um, a bit more transparent, I guess, with how not effortless this whole thing is. I think they should listen to a couple of podcast episodes. Uh, one was what uh, Danny did with Alan Flanagan about uh, obesity and the socioeconomic realities. Let me pull that up. But we'll also link this in the description so people will be it will be easier to find. So it's episode 363, Public Health Policy versus Personal Responsibility, Evidence versus Ideology. So yeah, in an ideal world, for example, would it be ideal for you to not have to think about food choices and the environment to be conducive to staying lean? And, you know, pretty much everywhere you looked, it was healthy choices and you would have to actually put some effort into seeking out junk food. And the, the kind of food that's surrounding you is the kind of food that is conducive to staying and um, being healthy and lean. Sure, it would be awesome, but that's not the reality we're in. The reality is that if you just, quote-unquote, listen to your body, 
mindlessly and you just, you know, let the environment dictate your, your behavior, you're going to be overweight. I mean, just look at the what's going on. That's not that's not an exaggeration. That is the reality we're facing. 67, 70% of US, UK, I think Ireland is close, is close to that. Either overweight or obese. Romania is, is, I think it's very similar. So it's not just, this is not some sort of, you know, excuse. Um, it's just a reality. So yeah, it would be awesome if um, if we didn't have to, to uh, consciously make choices uh, to, to remain healthier. But that's the uh, world we live in. So that's what I said that I don't think that uh, quote unquote normal exists. I mean, or whatever healthy eating or healthy in the psychological sense not physically like what is really healthy i mean is eating 200 grams of protein healthy eating you know making sure that you eat 40 grams of protein at least in each meal is that healthy quote unquote i mean whatever it's you know at this point i think each person should do whatever makes them not happiest because i don't really like that term makes them most fulfilled with their lives i think and if someone i just posted about this in one of my stories i was like um because i posted that before and after i sort of mentioned <laughs> well i sort of mentioned i mentioned in the caption that i get like 17 to twenty thousand steps and then i get people who like message me and like so did you do any cardio during this i'm like jesus fuck did you read the caption oh actually no because it was too long no oh, sweet thanks <laughs> but yeah so i i mentioned there that you know my activity is high and people message me and be like well you know it's you're so lucky to to have a lifestyle that allows you to be and it's true it's true and again this goes back to that personal responsibility versus realities thing yes not every person who uh who every, not every person has the option to do 20,000 steps per day. Not every person has the option to do six workouts a week. However, most people, when I posted this on my story, I said that however, most, most of you watching or reading this, you probably don't have children. You probably don't have families, don't have three jobs to work. So mo most of you are either from my city or cities which are similar. So um, I posted an image where I went out for a walk for like an hour because I was behind with my steps. And I was like, Yes, I'm lucky, but that's also sort of a choice, you know. Um, most of you could actually make the same choice. You could decide to get off your ass and take a walk for 60 minutes, for example, even if you work a sedentary job. And again, this goes back to what makes your life fulfilled. Hey, if you don't want to do that, that's completely fine. I'm not judging anyone if you're happy with eating. I mean, for example, Anthony Bourdain or Gerard Depardieu, I've seen them. Gerald Depardieu, I know, explicitly said the same. Hey, I'm going to have plenty of time to be healthy and lean. Whatever healthy. He said lean <laughs> when I'm in the grave. Like, when I'm alive, I want to enjoy myself. I want to eat the best foods in the highest quantities possible or something like that. Awesome. <laughs> if that's his, his choice, then that's his choice. But at the same time, I also hate people who, you know, start judging others or start uh, discrediting effort completely uh, with regards to things that are voluntary for example like going on a walk is not at nine o'clock in the evening is not due to my lifestyle it had nothing to do with me working in, being in the gym it was me getting off my ass and be like hey i'm behind with my steps let me get out and get some extra steps in and if you don't want to do that, that's awesome and completely fine. But then you should probably refrain from judging people who look leaner or are leaner or, you know, if you're not willing to do even the most minimal amount of sacrifice. Yep. Yep. Well said. And um, yeah, probably there is a good uh, place to wrap up. Um, yeah, just one thing, uh, you know, I sort of mentioned. And by the way, we didn't start this. I think we should... We should find a name for this if you're going to make this uh, regular segment. I was thinking, I don't know, bullshitting, bodybuilding, bullshitting, something like that would work. Banter is already taken, unfortunately, because I looked at a bodybuilding, bullshitting is, I think it's fine. <laughs> I also thought that, you know, we should have some sort of uh, either recommended reading or listening or whatever. Like, do you have anything? Because uh, I, for example, I already plugged the mess article i mentioned the sigma episode which is nice and related to that um i also mentioned uh 
you know, how physical activity or lack of physical activity is going to leave you with a pretty low calorie intake requirement. There is another episode which I really liked, uh, Muscle Memoirs episode 60 with Chris Melby, Energy Flux. This was a fun episode. Um, yeah, actually, the Muscle Memoirs podcast, I want to give a shout out to them because um, I really like Mike Murray. I think that's how you say his name. I think he's a really good interviewer, asks really good questions. I was on their podcast, actually, with Dave McConey. We were on there twice. So if you want to hear us uh, do a bit of shit talking on uh, set volume progression and discuss bulking, then I recommend you check those out. Uh, I will link the, them in the description. And, and also, so yesterday I listened to the Revive Stronger podcast um, and uh, they were discussing refeeds with Menno Hensomans, Brian Miner, Alberto Nunez and uh, Jackson Pios. And I was skeptical at first because like, man, like an hour long podcast episode and you have four guests on, like there's no way this is going to be productive. But actually it was much better than I anticipated. So I recommend you guys to check that one out as well. All right, so those are the recommendations. Um, that's gonna keep you. That should keep you occupied for a while. So, as always, feedback is yeah. welcome as long as it's not presented too ignorantly. We'll uh, take that on board. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, Andre. So um, enjoy the rest of your day, and see you. Yeah. Hopefully next week. Yep. Have a great day. All right. Ciao.